What's good, everybody? It's Crowpop for 30 here, and welcome back to ranking every single Godzilla film. In the last part, we reviewed every single Showa era Godzilla film. If you ever watched that, I would highly recommend stopping the video right now and going back and watching that because that was a lot. The Showa era had a lot of films, some great, some good, some iconic, and others that were Godzilla vs. Gigan. Yeah, some of them were rough, not gonna lie. But now we are here in what it's my opinion. The most recognizable era for Godzilla. I mean, if you saw my Godzilla ranking for every suit, you know I have a very special place for the Heisei era. I love this era. This is the era that I grew up watching most of the Godzilla films. And this is where I actually watched my first Godzilla film. Which one that'll be, you'll just have to wait and see. Make sure to hit that like subscribe button and let's get in to the Heisei era. After a long nine-year hiatus, the King of the Monsters makes his triumphant return into the 80s with Godzilla, or in the US, The Return of Godzilla. This is the first time I'll be watching the Japanese version of this movie instead of the US release starring Raymond Burr. And just real quick, I'll talk briefly about the US version, and yeah, it stinks. The shameless plugging of product placements was just ridiculous, and the only highlight of this film is the ending speech by Burr. So look it up on YouTube instead of watching the movie, as it was actually a great speech. A shame it had to be wasted on that movie. Although being the 16th film in the Godzilla franchise, The Return of Godzilla is a sequel to the 1954 classic, with no correlation to the other Showa era films. Which isn't going to be the last time this happens, especially for the next era of Godzilla films, that's for sure. I did enjoy this movie going back to its 54 roots when describing Godzilla as a monster created by mankind a bearer of destruction that leads to nothing but death and destruction anywhere Godzilla roams. But obviously, since this was the 80s, we also have Cold War conflict to deal with as well. It's hilarious that the Japanese government attempted at first to keep Godzilla's revival hidden from the public, but when a Soviet nuclear ship was destroyed by Godzilla, they instantly had to reveal Godzilla to the public to avoid a nuclear fallout between the USSR and the US. It's like, you probably should have done this earlier, guys. Could have saved you a lot of headaches instead of bringing the whole world down by just ignoring Godzilla and hoping he would just go back into the sea and go away. Although this is technically a solo Godzilla film, it was the Japanese government's turn to finally fight back against Godzilla, and they created a new weapon to hopefully defeat Godzilla this time with the introduction of the Super X. Personally, not the biggest fan of the Super X one, although it would return in other Godzilla movies with each movie having a new unique version, so, for the first one, it's alright, but it will get better when each movie passes, just you wait. I have to say, although I'm a big critical of this Godzilla's design, the cinematography in this movie was really well done. Katsumi Hara does a great job on this movie, especially the scene with Godzilla first making landfall and attacking the nuclear power plant. Those shots of Godzilla in the distance and the close-ups having the camera pan up to see him were all stupendous. Although some of those close-up shots still look goofy to me, I'm sorry, I just get over the fact that sometimes Godzilla does look a bit goofy, but overall the cinematography for this movie was really well done. The US and USSR shockingly agree that the only solution to stop Godzilla from destroying the world was by using nuclear weapons. I mean, Godzilla feeds off of nuclear radiation that wouldn't hurt Godzilla, it'd only make it stronger. So that's a bold strategy there guys, let's see how it plays out. I mean, using Godzilla in Japan as test dummies to use to see just how severe a nuclear warhead would be is kind of messed up, not gonna lie, with Japan stuck in the middle of two power-hungry countries. Heck, the use of nuclear weapons wasn't even needed, because at first the Super X did actually defeat Godzilla. It wasn't until a Soviet nuclear war it wasn't until a Soviet nuclear warhead was accidentally launched was Godzilla able to survive. Also, it's odd how in the US version they acted like the Soviets launched the missile on purpose when it was actually fired due to Godzilla's attack on the Soviet ship. Really odd how that was edited, but it sadly makes sense given the time frame this movie was released. So, yay, more propaganda. This is an odd movie for me to rate. As for the most part, it did a lot of things right when it comes to Godzilla and the effects. I thought personally I would hate this movie a lot more than I did, considering that for the most part I had this movie back all the way in D tier. But you know what, watching the Japanese version now, I gotta give credit where credit's due. This is actually a very fun movie to watch, and I'm shockingly gonna put it in B tier. This movie did a complete 180 for me. This was a major triumph of return for the King of the Monsters, and it deserves to be in B tier. With 
With Godzilla finally returning to the big screen in 1984 with The Return of Godzilla, Toho decided it was time to raise the stakes by having Godzilla's next movie be made by a contest winner. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, you heard me right. Toho held a contest to decide what the next Godzilla movie is going to be about, and over 5,000 people have participated. Man, if only I was able to submit my idea for the contest. Oh well, maybe one day Godzilla vs. Gorgo could finally happen in my lifetime, but I digress. The winner of this contest was a man named Shinchiro Kobayashi, a dentist and part-time screenwriter, and his story is absolutely crazy. It's full of espionage, cross splicing DNA, and terrorism. Man, just talking about this movie has me exhausted. This story was insane. While Lante herself is such an insane concept to begin with, being fused with Godzilla cells, a rose, and the blood of a scientist's daughter, Biolante is probably one of the most impressive suits made by Toho and stands apart from the rest of the kaiju, even to this day. Also, Godzilla returns in a big way, and I mean my boy has grown since the 5 years we've seen him, growing to an enormous 100 meters tall. This Godzilla design will be the mainstay for the Heisei era and with most Godzilla fans and even casual fans will most associate with what Godzilla should look like for decades to come. Watching the behind the scenes for this film, there was one scene in particular that caught my eye. As they showed a scene where Godzilla was being attacked by Bailante's vines, they used stop motion for this scene, and I'm sad that they didn't make the final cut for the film, as they deemed it didn't fit well for the entire movie, as a whole. But honestly, it looked so impressive. Seeing Godzilla use his tails to rip vines off of him and to defend himself from Bailante was so cool. It's a shame that this and the flower scene were cut from the film. The special effects created by Koichi Kadokita were a staple of what made the Heisei series stand out from the rest of the eras, and he'll be a part of every single Heisei movie going forward, so you can thank Mr. Kawakita for some of the best effects and monster fights in the Godzilla series. The MVP of the Heisei series will also make her first appearance in Godzilla vs. Biollante with the introduction of Miki Sagusa, played by Megumi Odaka, a powerful psychic that can telepathically communicate with Godzilla. Not sure in that one, but she is a mainstay for the next six Godzilla films, so she's a fan favorite. Godzilla vs. Biollante has it all, action, suspense, unique monster fights, and return of the new and improved Super X2. This is one of the craziest Godzilla films ever made. It would honestly fit really well into the Showa era with the themes of how far scientists should truly go in the name of science and the ethical dilemmas of cross splicing genes to create monstrosities. This movie is going straight into A tier. The Heisei era has gone off to a fantastic start. Can they keep the momentum going with the return of one of the most recognizable Godzilla monsters ever? That. What? The Heisei era is the first introduction for me when it comes to Japanese Godzilla movies. And what did you know it, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah was actually the first Japanese Godzilla movie I've ever watched. And yes, I said the first Japanese Godzilla movie. There's a reason why I'm being so specific, but we'll get to that during the Millennium video. So this is my first true introduction to Godzilla. Just like Godzilla vs. Biollante, this movie is crazy, with time travelers from the future landing at present day Tokyo. They are named the Futurians. But I'm just going to call them the Time Travelers, as saying Futurians honestly hurts my brain. Wanting to save a ravaged Tokyo in the future that was obliterated in 2204 by Godzilla, the Time Traveler's plans were pretty simple. They wanted to head back in time to the first Thanksgiving to get Godzilla off the menu. That's right, they're going back in time to the first Thanksgiving to get Godzilla off the menu. Actually, they planned to go back in time to World War II before Godzilla was turned into the nuclear god destruction we all know and love. Then just a tiny Godzilla Saurus, and push him somewhere else, causing the events of 1954 that never happened and Japan's future is actually saved. But that was all a ruse when they instead left behind three adorable little Dorats to take Godzilla's place, turning them into King Ghidorah. This left King Ghidorah as the true King of the Monsters, and since there's no more Godzilla, no one can send him to Ghidorah's wrath. However, the time travelers forgot about one thing, the Cold War. Thanks to constant nuclear testing throughout the region, Godzilla instead used the power of modern nuclear technology to become bigger, faster, and stronger too. So Godzilla's here to save the day from Ghidorah's tyranny, right? <laughs> WRONG! When Godzilla defeats King Ghidorah, Japan has another problem to deal with, as now Godzilla's on the rampage, 
And since there's no King Ghidorah to stop Godzilla, no one can set up to Godzilla's wrath. Wait a minute, didn't I already just say that? Luckily for Japan, one of the time travelers named Emi Kano assisted Japan as she had been only a pawn in the other Futurian scheme to take over the world. They betrayed her, so now she's going to seek justice. They used her to gain the trust with the Japanese people, and now she's on a mission to set things right. She even still has a time machine to use to get back to the future, find where King Ghidorah lays dormant, resurrect him in the future, bring him back to the past, and take on Godzilla in a new form called Mecha King Ghidorah. What a mouthful, my god. This movie is pretty polarizing for the Godzilla fanbase. Some people love this movie, while others consider this movie overrated, as the plot when they do remove Godzilla doesn't make too much sense, as when they have created a time paradox, resulting in no one from the present knowing about Godzilla, and instead causing another timeline to happen? How do these people still know about Godzilla? Besides the people that went back in time with the Futurians, obviously, wouldn't they know about Godzilla but no one else would? Wouldn't everyone else just know about King Ghidorah and all the mayhem he's been causing? And uh-oh, now I'm giving too much conflict to my ranking. Better stop now before I throw the movie into F for Futurians tier. With that being said, I'm on the side of loving this movie, and this is going straight into A tier, an iconic movie for the Heisei era. Even with all the plot holes, I still love this movie. <laughs> Out of all the Heisei films that I've seen, this movie is probably the second least watched film from this era. It's technically third, but I'm not counting Godzilla vs. Biollante because trying to find a DVD release for that movie was nearly impossible. I remember buying the VHS version and buying an actual VHS system to finally watch it, so I spent nearly $250 to originally watch Godzilla vs. Biollante. Godzilla vs. Mothra doesn't have that issue, it's just that the side of the two-way disc broke because I watched Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah too many times, and the disc became basically unreadable. But now, nearly 12 years later, I got a chance to rewatch the movie with the Blu-ray release and see just how it compares with the rest of the Heisei era. Godzilla vs. Mothra The Battle for Earth is a fresh start for Mothra, as it's been nearly 24 years since we've seen Mothra in a Godzilla movie, although her design in this movie isn't one of my favorite designs for her. She's just too fluffy for me, and she looks too cute and stiff to be taking on Godzilla. A major downgrade from the amazing effects that Mothra vs. Godzilla had, especially when it comes to Mothra's mobility. Remember that other Mothra lava that died before Ghidorah the Three-Handed Monster? Well, it's been growing for all this time and finally reintroduced itself as Batra, with Rodan's roar. Even as a kid, I thought that was weird how Batra had Rodan's roar, as we wouldn't see Rodan return until a year later. Batra being the opposite of Mothra was an interesting concept that I wish was fleshed out more during this film because this pairing reminds me more of Shadow and Sonic when it comes to the complex relationship between Batra and Mothra. The story itself is interesting to say the least, as 12,000 years ago there used to be an advanced civilization that lived on Earth, with Mothra as their protector. Everything was fine at first until the civilization tried to control the climate which made the Earth mad and the Earth created a negative Mothra called Batra. Oh, oh, okay. That's cool, I guess. The Earth could just create Batra if it wanted to. Fine. This movie does return to its roots, as instead of kidnapping an egg, the cosmos get kidnapped instead, so it's up to Mothra to save them, just like in the original 1961 movie. Even Mothra cocoons herself on a famous Japanese landmark. It feels like a retelling of the classic film, just this time starring Godzilla as a side character. The protecting the Earth message that this movie tried to convey does it hit quite as hard when comparing it to the first Mothra film and even Mothra vs. Godzilla? The main conflict is with Batra and Mothra, with Godzilla being the side character that the two forces have to unite against to bring balance back to the world. Like I said before, Godzilla being a side character in his movies can work. It did in King Kong vs. Godzilla and even Godzilla vs. Kong, but we haven't got to that movie yet, so just think of it as King Kong vs. Godzilla for now. The point is, the movie stretches a bit too thin, as you can honestly remove Godzilla from this movie and almost nothing would change, everything would stay the same. Maybe the ending would be a bit different, but probably not. Honestly, so it begs a question for me, why is Godzilla even here in the first place? The title really shouldn't be Godzilla vs. Mothra, it should be something like, I don't know, Mothra vs. Batra, Battle for Earth, or I don't know, Sonic Adventure 2, or Rebirth of Mothra. Yeah, that sounds catchy. 
Oh wait, yeah, that's right, Rebirth of Mothra. Yeah, this movie felt like a testing ground to see if the public wanted a new Mothra movie or not, and since the movie did well in the box office, it gave us the Rebirth of Mothra trilogy. If you want my quick thoughts on the series, it's okay. Honestly, you get a better trilogy series with Gamera, but if I had to rate them, they'd probably go into C tier. Just like this movie. The movie just felt so underwhelming to me. So many monsters returning in the Heisei era. First, it was King Ghidorah, then Mothra, so why not bring another iconic monster from the Showa era by bringing back a fan favorite? In 1993, Toho finally released Godzilla vs. the Giant Condor 2 Battleship Warfare, and wait, what do you mean, they brought back another monster? Who? Mechagodzilla. The creation of Mechagodzilla this time around was great, as he used the metal carcass from Mecha King Ghidorah and refurbished it. It also made another machine that can attach itself to Mechagodzilla called the Garuda. So this version is carrying some massive firepower in its arsenal. This movie has multiple Showa era classic monsters returning. Rodan, Mechagodzilla, Minya. Wait, Minya? Godzilla says that Actually, it's a new character, as the egg some scientists take from an island while Godzilla and Rodan are fighting, happens to hatch into not a baby Rodan like they initially thought. But instead, it was actually a baby Godzilla. Although I'm not the biggest fan of Baby Godzilla in this movie, in the later Heisei movies, making Baby Godzilla grow more and more to look like Godzilla was a nice callback, especially Godzilla Jr., how it pays a nice callback to how Godzilla Saurus used to look like, so that was a really nice touch. I can appreciate Toho trying to show the more affectionate side of Godzilla as Godzilla begins causing mayhem across Japan, attempting to search for his lost child. Would Godzilla do that for Minya? Yeah, most likely, but I thought it added some real touch to the story. Gotta be honest though, I did not really care for the scientists trying to protect baby Godzilla from Godzilla. It's like, hold up, Godzilla is literally destroying everything just to find his kidnapped son, mind you. Yes, his kidnapped child. What, you just wanted to keep it? And hope it didn't grow 100 meters tall? It grew nearly half of that size in a year. What are you thinking? I know the Heisei series is usually associated with just straight up beam fights, and to a certain extent, it's not an incorrect statement to make, but the fights between Godzilla, Rodan, and Mega Godzilla were a major highlight of the film, and this is the first Godzilla movie since what, 1954, that shows Godzilla actually getting killed. Yes, Mega Godzilla kills Godzilla in this movie. They even had to make poor Miki have to be the one to locate the perfect kill shot. Those villains. If it weren't for Rodan turning into Fire Rodan and sacrificing himself to revive Godzilla, that would probably be it for the Heisei era. Overall, this movie was a blast. It goes directly into A tier. The Heisei era just can't be stopped. How could Toho try and top this movie with their next release? Space Godzilla is a creep. He kidnaps baby Godzilla, now grown up into little Godzilla. For what reason? Space Godzilla is just a weirdo. Somebody call the police on this creep. Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla is probably one of the strangest Heisei films I have ever seen. It feels like a crazy Showa era film, just without the Showa era charm, leaving the movie as probably the worst film of this era. They even got Mogira back in this movie, although Mogira is a major downgrade from Mechagodzilla 2, this design just sucks. The original Mysterian's design is vastly superior. I don't get how people could be looking at the Mysterians Mogira and be like, this is really cheesy. Yes, it's meant to be cheesy. I mean, look at it. It looks like a wind-up toy. It looks phenomenal. It looks goofy. It looks fantastic. For the Mysterians, it's just perfect. It's so special. That's what makes the Magira design so unique for me and so special that it just looks, yeah, a little bit goofy, but I think the creativity of it really outshines the goofiness for Magira. So I just want to get this off this chest because I really like the design from Mysterians and they did my boy dirty in this movie. Absolutely dirty. Also, why did the G4 say that using telepathy to try to control Godzilla would work in any capacity? And to use Bogir to try and kill Godzilla after the failures of Mega Godzilla is just hilarious. They can't seriously expect this drill nosed loser to finish this job when Mega Godzilla couldn't. Let's not lie to ourselves now. 
Space Godzilla in this movie really isn't a slouch, as he easily takes down the first Bulgira and defeats Godzilla with ease. But why on the island are there already crystal formations before Space Godzilla even arrives on the planet? I always thought they were made because of Space Godzilla, so why are they there in the first place? Just be holding self for poor little Godzilla when Grunkle Space Godzilla shows up, I guess. Now, bear with me for a second, as I'm going to attempt to remember off the top of my head how Space Godzilla was created, because as I'm making this section of review real quick, I haven't rewatched the Japanese version, as I'm going strictly by the TriStar double release with Godzilla vs. Troya and Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. The English show was really weird, so I'm going to try to explain and remember it vividly on the top of my head what they're trying to convey on how Space Godzilla was created. Option 1. The G-Cells formed by Mothra after defeating Godzilla in Godzilla vs. Mothra Battle for Earth were lifted up into space, formed in a black hole, pushed out a white hole, and then we got Godzilla turned into Space Godzilla with all the crystals. That's option 1, okay? Option 2. Biolante was sucked into a black hole, which eventually turned into Space Godzilla. I don't know if that's the reasoning or the proper reasoning in the Japanese version, but that's one they gave us in the English version. So I'm going to watch it right now and see if I'm right. So much later that the old narrator got tired of waiting and they had to hire a new one. Oh, okay. So in the Japanese version, they explain that either situation could have been the reason for Space Godzilla existing. Okay. For some reason, they said in the English version, I remember correctly, it was like both. It was really weird. It made my brain hurt thinking, how the heck did Space Godzilla even get made? It was just... Rough. This movie feels like a cookie cutter Heisei era film that didn't know what it wanted to be. Even having a random subplot about Mickey getting kidnapped by the professor from the failed telepathy project to now be a crazed villain felt like odd filler that was such a random twist. Although seeing the bed levitate was hilarious, like they need to nerf Mickey. She's just way too powerful. This movie is going into D tier, the bottom of the D tier. I had more fun with Godzilla vs. Ibra and even Godzilla vs. Megalon. How do you make a movie more entertaining than Godzilla vs. Megalon Space Godzilla? And you know what? Just for that, I want to put Ibra all the way in low C tier because this movie actually made me appreciate more of these movies than this movie. Man, it felt like watching Godzilla Raids again. I never want to watch that movie again. After 41 years of Godzilla, 22 movies, and countless accolades given to the King of the Monsters, it was finally time for him to rest, and for the Godzilla franchise to officially end. With the finale to the Godzilla franchise being worldwide news, Toho had to think real hard about what the final opponent should be for Godzilla. Should it be King Ghidorah again? Maybe Mechagodzilla? Kamunga? Maybe even Gamera? Ooh, Gamera vs. Godzilla would be a masterpiece. The options were just endless. But Toho decided, you know what, let's just have Godzilla face the devil instead. Shadow, it's me, the devil. I'm here to convince you to do sin. Come with me, steal candy from babies and small businesses. Godzilla vs. Destroyer feels like the ultimate finale to the Godzilla franchise as every single Heisei film from 1984 to 1995 has been leading up to this. With a Godzilla that is glowing red, due to the overabsorption of radioactivity. This Godzilla is a literal ticking nuke ready to go off. Also, can I just say the opening scene with Godzilla destroying Hong Kong had some amazing shots. I know I haven't really gotten over that during this video, but I felt it was more the appropriate time to explain it now. As for the Heisei series, they love to blend shots of Godzilla in the distance or green screen into an actual scenery, and those shots are just spectacular. Throughout the whole Heisei era, you have multiple shots of actual scenery with Godzilla laying waste in the background. Those shots are absolutely amazing, especially here in Godzilla vs. Australia, they are at their best. These shots were the highlight of the Heisei era, and to be honest, I wish the Monsterverse had more shots like this. They just add something more to these movies, I just can't quite explain, it's like a feeling. You just can't quite explain it, but once you see it, you'll know. The movie also pays homage to the original Godzilla movie, as some of the characters are descendants of the survivors of the 1954 movie. It will even get to see Emiko again, played by Momoko Kochi. Just like in 1954, scientists are now attempting to create a new, safer oxygen destroyer by using micro-oxygens. But let's be real, 
Although the scientists mean well and all, you know, that's good and all. But history shows again and again how nature winds up the falling of man as they awaken a new type of monster. Also, why were attempting to build a new tunnel in the bottom of the sea where they build where they originally had killed Godzilla and where Sarazawa's bones are lying? That's just asking for trouble. For doing this, they accidentally released old crustaceans that had been mutated by the original Oxy Destroyer to transform into the monstrosity known as Destroya. And while all this is happening, they also have to deal with Godzilla melting down and using a new weapon to hopefully freeze Godzilla to avoid a catastrophic meltdown. It's the return of the Super X, now named the Super X-3. This Super X is new and improved and probably the best design as now it's more than a match to handle Godzilla. It even freezes him in place, at least for a while. This scene with Godzilla freezing is simply 10 out of 10. I don't know how they did it, but it looks amazing. They even have little Godzilla return, but he's no longer little, as by absorbing the radiation left by Godzilla when he destroyed their home. Thanks for that Godzilla, by the way. Little Godzilla has rapidly grown up and now has turned into Godzilla Jr. Probably my favorite form of baby Godzilla, as he can hold his own this time, it even takes on Destroya, although getting a big Xenomorph hole straight through the chest. It looks like Jr. actually defeated him. That wasn't even Destroyer's final form, as it been healing up all this time and waiting for the perfect time to reveal the true power of the Oxygen Destroyer. You know what's funny? In the beginning of the movie, it felt more like an homage, or it was really reminiscent to Aliens, which I really enjoyed as it made the movie more unique, and I'm not even that mad that the military were the ones that took down Destroyer when the coward tried to flee when he knew he wasn't strong enough to take down Godzilla. Don't even remind me of the ending, because just hearing the first few notes gets me all teary-eyed. I swear, even to this day, it's tough to watch the meltdown scene without getting teary-eyed. For Akira Ifakube's final movie, he went out with a bang, making some of his most iconic tracks here that I can't share or else I get content ID, but I would highly recommend searching them up. They are simply amazing. For the finale of the Heisei era, Godzilla vs. Destroya is going all the way up into S-tier, the perfect ending for this franchise. Wait, what do you mean we aren't done? They made more? Well, what caused Toho to come back so fast? That's a lot of fish. Oh, yeah. But there we have it. Every single Heisei Godzilla film ever made ranked. Uh, I'm sorry this one took a lot longer than the Showa film to make. Uh, this was originally supposed to be released on Thursday, but it's going to be releasing on Saturday as the script kind of turned into a monster, as originally thought, oh, you know, I'll just put on my thoughts for the Heisei film. It's only seven movies. How, how long could that be, right? It turned into a 13-page script, and Godzilla vs. Destroya basically had two pages by itself. I love that movie, so I kind of went a little bit overboard. But the Heisei era was really interesting to rank, as some movies I always loved, like Godzilla vs. Destroya, Biollante, King Ghidorah, Mega Godzilla 2, and some I really changed my mind on, like Godzilla 1985. I really didn't like it at first, but rewatching it in Japanese for the first time, it really blew me away how good the movie actually was. And let's not talk about Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, shall we? Next up, we're heading into the Millennium Era, and this era is going to be real interesting to review, starting off with Godzilla 1998. I'll catch everybody on Tuesday. Later, everybody.